Welcome to the National Museum Palace of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania. My name is Laura, I'm archaeologist and a guide right here. Today I'll be your virtual guide and today we'll visit our International Exhibition Hall. Today we will see the collection from Giorgia Barati that came from Italy Milan called From Sacro to Profano. We'll see around 90 pieces that go from paintings to tapestries plus sculpture. All of these items are supposed to showcase the difference between different pieces of art during 16th and 17th centuries. A lot of them will correlate to the periods when our rulers like Vasa Dynasty or Jagiellians were purchasing a lot of pieces of art uh, for our residences, including obviously our royal palace. Going down to technical terms, the exhibition itself is separated into two floors and overall has four halls. Uh, the first one is dedicated to Old and New Testament that includes obviously the prophets, uh, the Christ, and then the next ones are dedicated to different other topics that we'll talk as we'll go along. Talking about the first pieces of art, let's go to the wall that showcases um, characters from the Old Testament. So here we see a painting by Domenico Piola. It was painted in the beginning of 17th century, showcasing the angel exhorting Lot to flee with his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. The next painting also comes from the Old Testament. Uh, here we can actually see Jacob's blessing from Filippo Vitale, also from the 17th century. What is interesting, Vasa family preferred paintings. They would quite often travel to Italy, specifically Vladislav Vasa, to bring those paintings back. While on the opposite spectrum, we have Jagiellian dynasty that existed and ruled a bit earlier on, and they prefer tapestries. One of them, well, not one of their collection pieces, but one of the tapestries that they probably would have appreciated, we can see right here. Tapestries were never made in ones. Usually they were made in sets. It's believed that this specific tapestry is one of the six. It is dated as the end of uh, 15th century, the beginning of 16th century. And for a very long time, it was believed that two tapestries from that set were completely lost. But during long-term research uh, before this exhibition, we learned that this is actually one of the two that were presumably missing. Another four are currently housed in the USA. One sadly is still missing, and this one can be seen in front of us. We know that originally this specific tapestry was created to basically decorate uh, the church that was dedicated to Saint Mary. Now, as we'll continue forward, we'll notice there's more paintings showcasing Jesus Christ, different prophets, Saint Mary. Once again, Old and New Testaments merging together, creating what we now know. Interesting fact, in this collection we also have one painting that belonged to famous movie director Visconti. Here we can actually see this specific painting. It was painted at the very end of 16th century, the beginning of 17th, by Santi di Tito. It showcases the Annunciation to Saint Mary. What is interesting overall, in this exhibition we have at least three paintings showcasing angels talking to Saint Mary marry and basically talking about her future. Now let's move on to the next part. What is interesting that in the Old Testament and the New Testament angels were always mentioned. Some were seen as the guardians, others were seen as the ones that would send or bring the message. Here we have three pieces of art that exactly showcase that fact. Not only angel, angels look pretty and obviously making painters want to paint them, but it also conveyed a lot of times a different message. Here we can see the painting from the 18th century painted by Francesco Fontebasso. What is interesting with, when it comes to this specific painting is that usually when it comes to mirrors uh, that are symbols of vanity or temporariness, uh, they, it's usually held by a woman. 
In this case, however, it is held by two children, once again showcasing the change as well. Next interesting piece of art that we can also see in this area would be this beautiful painting that came from the end of 16th century and the beginning of the 17th. It was painted by Giovanni Antonio Galli, also known as uh, Spaderino. And why this one specifically is unique is that if you look at it, we can only see little heads with wings, no bodies, nothing. That correlates to the fact that a lot of angels would have a different purpose. These ones specifically probably were the ones sending little messages. Now, slowly but surely, let's move on towards the second floor. But on the way, we will see one big piece of art that really stands out from the others. So here we can see the painting of Giacobo Negretti that was painted uh, at the end of 16th century. And why this specific painting is unique, it's not only huge in size, but it also based on what theme you can see within. Usually when it comes to themes of Annunciation and with Saint Mary and any angels, Mary takes at least a bigger part of the painting. In this case, Angel Gabriel actually is almost overtaking the painting itself, which makes it way more unique compared to the other two that we have in this specific collection. This specific painter is very important to Lithuania because we know for a fact that Sigismundus Vasa actually ordered quite a few pieces of his art for his own private collection and to also embellish some of the churches in Poland. Now, without any further ado, let's move on to the second floor of this exhibition where we'll discover other themes. So now we are on the second floor, and the second floor starts with the room that is dedicated to Saint Mary and Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the items that I really would like you to look at is actually the oldest piece of art in the specific room. It's actually Mother of God with a Child. It is dated as the second and third quarter of the 14th century. Uh, because this area houses not only the paintings but other pieces of art like sculptures, I would like you to look at the opposite side where we can see a piece of art that was created by a person that at that time was very well known. Um, here we see uh, Christ uh, at the column amid cherubims, and the piece itself was created at the middle of 16th century and known uh, by, well, the creator was known as Padovano. Now, another interesting piece of art, talking about sculptures, that has nothing to do uh, with this author, but uh, is very well known in the world, would be uh, right there. Here we have two items that were created either by Donatello or by Donatello and people who were under him. So we know for a fact that this piece of art was definitely created by Donatello. Researchers looked into little details like hairs and wings and they did say it is definitely his uh, work of art. However, on the opposite side, we have piece that probably was created by someone who was working uh, in his proximity and either were influenced by him or had him as a mentor. Uh, the next room that we'll go into uh, goes through the pathway where we will be able to see some of the pictures of the items that we really wanted to get, but sadly because of their uniqueness or their value to Italy, we had to leave behind. So let's continue on. So here we can see some pictures of pieces of art that we really wanted to bring here, but because of their value to Italy, sadly they couldn't be displayed uh, abroad. One of the pieces of art, specifically this one, is important because it is the oldest item in Baratta's collection, uh, and it is actually dated 13th century. Once again, it's showcasing Saint Mary with a baby. And without further ado, let's continue on to the next part of the exhibition. 
So this specific area is dedicated to the saints uh, that were basically showcasing themselves uh, to the Christ. Uh, behind me and to the left of me, we have Saint John the Baptist. Then we have quite a few pieces of art of one of the most popular saints of that time. So on the left, we see one painting of Saint Lucia. Then we have three paintings of Saint Magdalene, one painting of Saint Christina and another painting of Saint Margaret on of Corona praying before the crucifix. Uh, this area, like I said, was dedicated to more uh, saint people. The other one will be dedicated to clergy and to some of the political figures that were important at that time. So uh, this area is dedicated uh, to clergy and lay figures. One of the figures that is extremely important to Lithuania is actually the Pope uh, Leo X. Uh, and he also was a very interesting figure. By the age of 14, he was promoted to cardinal. Why he specifically is important to Lithuania? Well, he was the one who actually uh, didn't allow uh, Luther to be part of the church and also he's also that pope to whom our nobility wrote to asking to pronounce Casimir a saint. He does exactly that, not only that he will also pronounce Saint Bruno the saint as well. We can see the painting of Saint Bruno right on the opposite side. Coming back to Pope Leo X, he was actually a very well-known funder of art, especially he loved funding Raphael. Uh, this specific painting is the copy of the famous painting that Raphael painted, and this specific painted, painting was actually made at the beginning of 16th century. On the opposite side from the Pope, we can actually see uh, lay figures or specifically the portraits of different political people, including one and only Cleopatra. Uh, she sadly in this painting is depicted with a snake in her hand. And well, at this point, we know that she met her untimely death and was the last Egyptian uh, ruler. On the opposite side, from Cleopatra, we have a person who is very important to Lithuania because mainly, if not him, we would have not had Bona Sforza herself. We have two sculptures depicting her grand grandfather and one of which I would like you to look at a bit closer. So Francesco Sforza was a grand-grandfather of Bona Sforza, of a wife of Sigismundus the Old. Interestingly enough, Francesco was known for quite a few things. One of them is his character. He managed to start as a simple warlord and rise to the Duke of Milan. Hence why Sforza later on was capable of even forging this friendship with Sigismundus the Old. Some people believe, and we would like to believe too as well, that some of his characteristics like strong will, a drive for education, rubbed off on Bona, and this is one of the reasons why she was one of the strongest female rulers in Lithuania and Poland. So the last, the fourth exhibition hall is dedicated to Profano and it's separated in few themes, Greek and Rome ancient art. Uh, example of it we can see right here. This painting was made by Bronzino. It was painted in the beginning of 16th century and it showcases the competition between Apollo and Marcias. Uh, other themes that will be seen on the way would be still life that we can see on this side, or I should say static life. Mostly we have different pieces of fruit and items showcasing other side of the society besides religion. And on the very opposite side, we can actually see different architectural landscapes, once again showcasing everyday life for the most part. And as the final stop, I would like you to come here with me to look at this beautiful tapestry in the very middle of this room.
So here we have a tapestry that uh, was basically made in the beginning of 16th century in Brussels. Sadly, we don't know who the creator was. Uh, we believe it was anonymous Flemish Romanist painter uh, who was in the circle of Bernard van Orle. Uh, this specific tapestry showcases the moment when Jupiter, in the guise of Diana, departs from Callisto uh, from a series of scenes of Diana, Jupiter, and Callisto. Why I wanted to stop by this specific tapestry? Before Vasa dynasty comes to Lithuania and Poland, we know for a fact that the Hegelians really, really liked tapestries. They were practical, it was easy to move them, and once again, they were beautiful pieces of art. This tapestry, if you will notice, have different scenes in it. We have Jupiter acting as if he is Diana, trying to trick and basically um, take Callisto from the uh, group. Uh, it works out, and in the end, the actual Diana will push Callisto from her group, and Callisto, in the end, will have a child from Jupiter. Even though this is quite a sad scene, like I said, it is a very beautiful piece of art where each piece of clothing is showcased in very detailed manner almost in the same way as in Sigismundus Augustus or Sigismundus the Old collections, where each tapestry, like I said, was supposed to depict part of myth, mythology, or the idea that they wanted to convey. So now that we have visited all parts of this exhibition, I would like to thank you for your time. And even though I know this specific virtual tour was quite short, but it is with intent. Instead of me telling you about paintings or specific parts of the paintings, I invite you to come to us and to actually experience it for yourself. Because let's be real, Paintings and art is actually experienced individually and can't really be di dictated by other people. So, hopefully see you soon and goodbye!